This conference yeah, will now be recorded. This today, but they can watch it later. And just, just a reminder, we do put the Bible studies and the sermons online on our website. So if you just go to northridgelamisa.com, you can see those. They normally don't show up until about a day or two later. And actually, I just put Sundays up today. So sometimes it's three days later. But when I get them sent to me from our website guy, I will then be able to load them up and, and put them on the website. So that's what uh, we're doing. And if you ever miss one, we encourage you to, to go there and to listen. We um, are working our way through a bunch of parables uh, in throughout Jesus' teachings this summer for Bible study. And we've, we've looked at quite a few Bible studies and parables this summer. And the, the one that we're going to look at today is probably the shortest of the parables that we're going to be looking at. It's only two verses long, but we're going to spend some time. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hey, we need show and tell, Jim. We need show and tell. Go for it. Well, I appreciate it, Al. I've been on this show and tell since 530 to try to get it right. And I've changed it over 1,200 times. But <laughs> driving Jeannie crazy. But I, I know now what you go through when you're preparing your sermon, you and Hob. <laughs> it, it's insane to get this exactly right. I don't know. Can anybody hear me? Yeah, we can hear you. Okay. Well, number one, uh, I'm trying to top Lonnie's uh, uh, show and tell last week, which the preacher then right stepped in and preached on the same thing, on the lantern and different things. But I don't think he can go preach on fish, dogs, or Santa Claus. But if he decides to, this is this is my my trout which uh, you can't really see because I never could get the light right, but three trout swimming in the uh, the river, which is my favorite, and uh, didn't cost much, but it means a lot to me. The second thing that I have is that uh, Jeannie's Santa Claus, which, uh, you know, she's got enough Santa Clauses to uh, build another church, but... Uh, this one is her pride and joy from a lady in Lubbock that makes these. And so uh, we buy them at the antique store, and they're sort of nice. And I thought maybe Jody would appreciate this. And uh, the third thing is really precious to me. This is a toy that my dad left me, and it's over 100 years old. And it, it's, a, it's a deal that it's got a box in here. and and you you put it together with four different sizes and four different pictures and uh, the one that's on here now is you really can't see but it's the dogs three dogs at the bottom with a squirrel in the tree at the top and uh, my daughter and my son are fighting over this thinking I'm gonna die tomorrow but anyway they both say they want it and I don't know I may give it to Al but uh, <laughs> I know he'd appreciate it. Anyway, that's show and tell. All right, thank you very much, Jim. That was that that was wonderful. That that was great. So, um, hey, Aaron, you're up next week for show and tell. So you're going to have to come up with two things for show and tell. Can you do that next week, Aaron? I might be able to. <laughs> All right, I bet you can. Well, that's good. Thank you, Jim, for sharing that. And my wife definitely enjoys all of the Christmas Santa Clauses that Jeannie has collected over the years. She talks about them every year when we go to the Christmas party at your house. So well, Jeannie you. definitely is impressed with your <clears throat> Santa Clauses. So and that's a cool story, too, uh, especially since it's 100 years old. That's crazy. That's That's really neat. So... All right, thank you so much for sharing, Jim and Aaron. We look forward to hearing from you next week when we do show and tell. Um, so back to our parable, and we're, we're going to be looking at a parable this week, and it's going to be the shortest one that we look at. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen with you, and hopefully I can get it pulled up real quick. Here we go. 
So the, the parable that we're looking at this week is in Matthew 13. Um, and in, in this chapter in Matthew, there's, there's um, the parable of the sower and the seeds, which we've looked at already. And then there's a parable of the, the good plants that are growing. And if the enemy came and, and put weeds inside of them and, and Jesus says, no, don't go tear the, don't go destroy it because you're going to destroy the good with the bad. And then we get to this one, and this is the parable of the mustard seed. So three parables in a row, Jesus is talking about uh, seeds and plants and things growing. Uh, but this one is, uh, it's about the kingdom of heaven, and I'm just going to go ahead and read it to you. It's Matthew 13, 31 through 32, and this is the New Living Translation that we're looking at today. It says, here's another illustration Jesus used. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed planted in a field. It is the smallest of all seeds, but it becomes the largest of garden plants. It grows into a tree, and birds come and make nests in its branches. So I think many of y'all have, have heard this before and, and heard this parable before. But and this isn't the only time that a mustard seed is, is used in Jesus' teaching. He also says in another place that if we have faith the size of a mustard seed, we can do miraculous things. We, we can even move mountains. So the mustard seed was something that was very familiar in Jesus' time, and it was a very, very familiar crop in Jesus' time. So when he used this illustration, the people... Uh, that heard this illustration, their ears perked up and they knew exactly what they were talking about. That's the way it is with most of the parables of Jesus. The, the examples and the things that he used are very familiar, and, and they understand those. Sometimes it was harder for them to, to see the meaning behind it and to get to the truth in what he was talking about, but the examples he used were very relevant to the time and the place in which Jesus was teaching and to the people he was teaching to. So here he is. He's talking about the kingdom of heaven. And this is one of those things that I think sometimes we don't talk about the kingdom of heaven nearly as much as we should. Uh, the kingdom of heaven was something that Jesus came to proclaim and he taught on in many different ways throughout Scripture. And we're going to look at some of those. But he's talking about the kingdom of heaven here. And he said it's like a mustard seed. And the mustard seed is the smallest of all the seeds. There's actually probably some seeds that are smaller than that, but out of the productive seeds that were used in a garden, um, it was the smallest seed in that time. There were probably seeds of weeds that were smaller or, or other plants that weren't really significant, but out of the crops that people planted and that they grew, the mustard seed was definitely the smallest of them all. And it says that it becomes the largest of garden plants uh, it even grows to be the size of a tree. Mustard plants here in America, uh, they don't really get that big. They get to be more like bushes or shrubs. But there are stories that uh, from the time of Jesus and other writings outside of the biblical literature um, that the mustard plant uh, grew sometimes to 8, 10, even 12 feet tall in these gardens. It, there's a story of people coming from actually different countries to come in to see the mustard plant uh, that was so large in what they had there. So it was very relevant to the people that were receiving this on this day when Jesus was telling this story. And um, we're going to look at it a little bit more. But first I want to look a little bit into some other areas in Matthew where Jesus talks about the kingdom. Um, in Matthew 4, 17, it says, From then on, Jesus began to preach, Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. This is at the beginning of Jesus' ministry as he is just beginning. And the message that he was preaching was the repentance of sins. Uh, that's one thing that is very important in our faith and our understanding of who Jesus is and what he came to do, is that we are sinful people in need of a Savior. We need to repent of our sin and our way of our life or fallen and brokenness in our life, and we need to turn to God. Uh, repentance is more of turning towards God than it is from turning from your sins. It's I'm going this way, and this way is wrong, and the way that I'm going is wrong, and there's sinful things this way, but 
if I turn and I find where God is and I begin to go in the direction in which God is leading me, that leads me away from those sinful things and it leads me in the direction in which God wants me to do. And that is the very heart and soul of what the kingdom of heaven is. The kingdom of heaven is the people of God, the people of God who are made up uh, in the image of God that have received the spirit of God through their belief in Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit coming in them. The kingdom of God is made up wherever those people are as they are following God. And so it's this small thing that begins to grow and it begins with individuals and it goes from there. But at the very essence of it is, it's uh, people um, following God and participating in his kingdom. They're turning from their sins, they're turning towards God, and they're participating in what God would have them do. So that's Matthew 4.17. Also, John the Baptist spoke on the same thing in Matthew 3 when he was preparing the way for Jesus. He said the same message. In Matthew 3, 2, it says, Repent of your sins and turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is near. So Jesus and John say the same things. Repent of your sins, turn to God, for the kingdom of heaven is here. So in the Gospel of Matthew, the kingdom of heaven is tightly interwoven uh, with the repenting of our sins and turning to God and allowing God to work in our lives and lead us and direct us. And that kingdom of heaven is when we are following God as individuals and also as the larger body of Christ. So we continue to, to move on in the scriptures, and this is uh, another example in Matthew 4.23, uh, another example of the kingdom, and it says, Jesus traveled throughout the region of Galilee, teaching in the synagogues and announcing the good news about the kingdom, the good news about the kingdom of God. And he healed every kind of disease and illness. So that when we look at this, the first two said that the kingdom of God is about us repenting of our sins and turning to God and following him as he leads. And in this part in the teaching about God, Jesus traveled, he shared the good news, the gospel, the good news of who he was and what God was doing in and through him in the kingdom. And in a part of that, uh, diseases were healed, illnesses were healed, and, uh, and wholeness was brought. So the kingdom of God is also about diseases being healed, illnesses being healed, and people be receiving wholeness. So that's another part of the kingdom of God. And then in 5.3, this is in the, the, the Sermon on the Mount. And then Jesus, this is how he's beginning it. And he, and he says this, God blesses those who are poor and realize their need for him, for the kingdom of heaven is there. And, and I, I, I don't really like this translation as much as I do the other translations. And other translations will say, God blesses the poor in spirit, for the kingdom of heaven is there. But the poor in spirit are those who, who their spirit is poor and that they know that they can't do it. Only God can do. So the poor in spirit, um, for those God, God who recognizes and blesses the poor in spirit, are those who, who, who realize their need for the kingdom of heaven is there. And, and that's an important thing. Um, if we're trying to do it on our own, and if we're trying to produce our own kingdom, uh, the kingdom of Al, the kingdom of Javier, the kingdom of Jody, uh, the kingdom of Lamisa or Lubbock or Texas or America. Or, that, that's not what we want. We don't need to be uh, promoting the kingdom of ours. We need to realize that we can't do that, and we need to promote the kingdom of heaven in which God is leading us. So some other teachings uh, in Matthew about the kingdom, uh, and this is in Matthew 20, which is later in the Sermon on the Mount. It says, but I warn you, Unless your righteousness is better than the righteousness of the teachers of religious law and the Pharisees, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. And, and what we know about this is that the Pharisees were very, very strict. They had a list of 200 and something laws that they followed to the T, and they really did try to perfect them and out of their own actions perfect themselves into a way that they would be in the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven. And we also know that Jesus 
teaches that this is not possible. Um, all of sin is a false word. Who is the greatest of the kingdom of heaven? There's, there's a lot to learn and to pay attention to there, but it, so much of it rings true to what we've already established about the kingdom of heaven. Uh, the kingdom of heaven is about turning from your sins, repenting from our sins, and turning towards God. It's about being like a little child. A little child is someone that knows that they need the help of their parents. They need their parents to lead them, to provide for them, to guide them, direct them. And to teach them. So unless you turn from your sinful ways and the ways in which you are going, turn towards God and then become like little children who trust their parents to, to lead them, to guide them, to teach them, to direct them, all of that, you will never get in the kingdom of heaven. So that goes along with the other teachings that we had. And Jesus just uses another illustration here on how to establish that or how to describe it. And then he uses this word here, humble. So anyone who becomes as humble as this little child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. So it's really kind of turned upside down. Jesus in the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God, it's something that is turned upside down compared to what we look at in the world. In the world, the greatest ones are the ones that are the most powerful, that have the most stuff that can get the most things done on their own, that can make things happen. Uh, think about politicians or big businessmen or, you know, even franchise owners in the NFL. You know, it's the ones that have the most and that are the strongest are the ones that get the most done. But Jesus completely turns the kingdom of heaven upside down and says that it's not about what you can do and the power that you have and the knowledge that you have and all of that. It's the humbleness, the ones that humble themselves as this little child. Those are the ones that are the greatest. So how do we become the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? We are like a child and we have put our complete faith and trust into God and into Jesus. And, and that's really interesting because, you know, we are a child of God. We are the children of God. We are the sons and daughters of the Most High King. Um, when we become... Uh, Christians, the Spirit of God comes inside of us, and we are now children of God. So, and the way to be, so once we are children of God, we, we are in the kingdom of God, to be the, but to be the greatest in the kingdom of God is to be the most humble and to rely on our Father, to rely on Jesus, and to humble ourselves and to rely on Him. So that's another teaching about the kingdom of God that Jesus shares in the Gospel of Matthew. And I think I have one more, and this is one that we've looked at before this summer in other parables, but this is in the Lord's Prayer. It says, May your kingdom come soon, may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Very simply, the kingdom of God is his sovereignty and rule and where that sovereignty and rule is taking place. So in heaven, we know that his sovereignty and rule is taking place. And our prayer, Jesus' prayer that he teaches us, 
is that his sovereignty and his rule will be done on earth as well. So we can say that the, the kingdom of God is where the will of God is being done. And we know that this is a fallen and broken world and there's sin throughout this world, the sin that he told us to repent from and to turn from. So we know that the kingdom of God isn't everywhere on this earth because there's so much sin and brokenness on this earth um, because, because of that. But his will is being done. His kingdom is being advanced where his will is being done. So we as individuals, wherever we are doing the will of God as he leads us and directs us, that's where the kingdom of God is. Also, as the body of Christ, uh, universal, uh, worldwide, wherever the body of Christ is at work, doing the will of God, that is where the kingdom of God is being advancing and, uh, and growing. So, in Jesus' prayer, his prayer is, is that, you know, your will be done on earth just as it is in heaven. And that is very much tied in to the kingdom of God. So, real quick, I want to look at two things here. The kingdom of God has uh, two aspects in it. The first is that it's your will be done in me. Um, there is a very personal, relational aspect uh, to being a follower of Christ, to being a Christian, to being a disciple of Jesus, to being born again, You know, however you want to say it. There's a very specific relational aspect of that. And, and we are wanting God's will to be done in me. Um, I want my life to change. I want God to change me in such a way that where there is anger and bitterness and sadness and, and all these things that aren't of God, I want it to be replaced with love and joy and peace and patience and kindness. I, I want his will to be done in me. I want him to change me in such a way that I am a different person and wherever I am, I am participating in the kingdom of God, that, that um, my ears are attuned to the voice of God in my life, and as he is leading me, I am participating in his will. And I really think that that is one that um, is really easy for us. I think that we hear that all the time. Um, the kingdom of God is us paying attention to what God wants us to do in our life. And I think that that's one that we are more familiar with, and we probably talk about that one more. But the second one is that your will be done in the earth, or your will be done on the earth. Um, so often I think that we have excuses that I'm just going to worry about me and what God's doing in and through and around me. And sometimes we don't see the big picture we don't see the earth aspect of it that it's your will be done on heaven as it will be done on earth as it is in heaven god wants his kingdom uh, to be declared throughout the earth he wants that healing that wholeness that reconciliation that sense of humbleness and people are receiving him as a father they, he wants that to be done all over the earth. So the way that we do that is we partner together with those of us, those others of us in the body of Christ. Uh, the body of Christ is a universal thing. Our brothers and sisters are on the other side of the world. Our brothers and sisters uh, don't look much like us, but they are our brothers and sisters, and God is working in his kingdom through them all over the earth to do it. So as Christians, we need to be very sensitive to where God is.
Jesus at this time is getting very close to going to Jerusalem. Uh, he's ending the near the, the end of his life. Uh, the, the disciples have been with him probably at this point a couple of years, maybe a little over a couple of years. And, and they're following. Uh, while it was good, it started out with Jesus saying, Hey, you, come and follow me. Hey, you, come and see. Hey, you, be one of my disciples. It started very Paul, and, and it began to grow. And now the disciples, I think the disciples are sitting there, and they're going, hey, this is great. You know, Jesus walks into a town, and all of a sudden we have you know, hundreds of people that are crowding around the temple of Jesus. But the disciples are not excited about it. Africa, had gone to Asia, had been in Europe, and, and this small kingdom that began in this tiny sliver of a country called Israel began to grow and to spread. So just hundreds of years later, um, it was beginning to grow. And now we look at it in the world, and um, just in every continent, it, you know, it's, it's spread all over the place and still beginning to grow. But there's some things that uh, we always are tempted to relate it to our own. Uh, you know, Europe right now, uh, 200 years ago, the church was the strongest in the world. Now the church seems to be the smallest.
All right. I think, how long did y'all not hear? <laughs> All right. It just kind of cut in and out on my end. Well, the battery went out on my microphone. And I'm sorry, guys. Technology. Ooh. Okay. Let me try it again. All right. Here we go. Man, I'm sorry, guys. This is not not my forte. I am not the the guy that knows how to do all this stuff. <laughs> but we're figuring it out. So thanks for noticing that, Hav, and, and bringing that to my attention. But, so in the smallest of things, it can start as the smallest of things. And in our life individually, it can also start as the smallest of things. I don't know if anybody has ever just said a sentence to you uh, or a statement to you that just might have been in passing or is in a conversation or something you might have heard in a sermon, sermon or something that you read in a book or you heard on a song, that it was the smallest of things, but something, God did something in that, and it planted a desire inside of you that blossomed into something great. Um, in my own life, um, I remember I went on a walk to Emmaus uh, going on 25 years ago now, I went on a walk to Emmaus, and on that walk to Emmaus, the pastor very simply said, prayer is not a means to the end, prayer is the end. And that very small statement that he said, prayer is not a means to the end, prayer is the end. Um, that, that's, that statement stirred something inside of me that literally changed my life and it it was probably the foundation of whatever ministry or whatever i've done in the church or on college campuses or church camps or or any of that stuff that one statement was the smallest of things but looking back over the last 25 years it has bloomed or blossomed and to something that was, I would think, would be pretty significant in my life and hopefully in the lives of others. And I don't know if you've ever watched the movie about William Wil Wilberforce or read any books about William Wilberforce, but he's the one that, he was a contemporary of John Wesley in England, and he was very much behind uh, the abolition of the, the wiping out of slavery in England. And um, he tells a story in his biography of how he is sitting in, and he was a, like a, he was like a congressman. They don't call him congressmen over there, uh, but he was a, he was an elected leader in their community, in their government. And um, he tells this story about how he's sitting in this person's garden having tea uh, and they're thinking, and he's just kind of in deep thought. And the person that he sits with just says, Hey, William, have you ever thought about writing a piece of legislation about slavery? And uh, William Wilberforce says that that one statement began to stir something inside of him that he uh, dedicated the rest of his life. He presented the same legislation in different forms for over 40 years until it got passed and slavery was abolished. But he says, he points back to that one moment in that garden where that one sentence was uttered to him that God began something in him. And that's what the kingdom of heaven is like. That's what the kingdom of God is like. It's something that's small that starts in, in us as individuals, but when we're faithful to it, we trust in that and we follow his lead, God does incredible things with it in the greater kingdom and in the greater heaven. Um, real quick, we're going to wrap it up here real quick, but the last thing I want to talk about is the birds. It grows into trees and the birds come and make nests in its branches. So like I said earlier, these mustard plants back in this time 
uh, could grow to be 8, 10, even 12 feet tall. And they would often have birds that would come and make nests in that. Um, I think there's probably two ways you can look at this, uh, the birds coming to, to make nests in it. Um, one, I think it could be a good thing um, that the birds, that the church, that the kingdom of God, the body of Christ is a place that, that gives sanctuary um, to, to, the, to the creatures of the earth. It's a place where people can come and feel safe and have sanctuary and be apart um, from the dangers of the world. So I think that that is part of what the, the church is, is that we are to, to help and to provide sanctuary and to provide for the needs of and, and all of those things. But I also think there's a, probably a negative connotation about this. Um, and I was reading about this earlier, but the birds sometimes in Scripture are viewed as bad. You know, the birds are the ones that come and pick the seeds up off the path. And Jesus says, the birds are like Satan coming in when the, the gospel gets shared, the seed gets slung, the birds come up and eat it up before it gets there. And, and I think this could also be a warning to us that sometimes in the midst of the kingdom of God, there are people um, that try to be there, but they really probably aren't a part of the kingdom of God. They haven't humbled themselves. They haven't repented of their sins. They haven't been in this place. While they're there and they're in the midst, their motivations are wrong. And uh, they have come to steal, kill, and destroy. And, and the only way we can tell that is just by discernment and who God is and what God's teaching us and re revealing to us. And, but our job as the kingdom of heaven is to help those birds and share the good news with them and tell them of the repentance and hopefully that that truth would take root in them and that they would also come. So the birds, they come. And so some, sometimes in the kingdom of heaven, bad things still happen in the kingdom of heaven because there's birds in our midst. And sometimes we might be those birds. We might be so distracted and so selfish or whatever that we are children of God, yet we're doing things um, that are not, lining up with the kingdom of heaven and so that would you know those are just some thoughts that i had about the birds um and it might be just for the birds so so there you go that's free but i'm going to go ahead and turn my screen off now and i'm going to does anybody have any questions or comments or uh anything that they noticed that stood out to them that they wanted to share and i apologize once again about the the um sound did anybody have anything that they'd want to share or that they noticed? All right. Well, I'll go ahead and and close this out with prayer, and then I'll let you all chat a little bit and say goodbye, and and uh, it'll be a good day. But uh, Father God, we just love you and praise you, and just thank you for this uh, this short but powerful parable about the kingdom of heaven. And how it's something that's small and it grows into something big. Something bigger than what we can imagine. And uh, Lord, that's something in our own lives as individuals. You begin something small in us and you want to change us into something great. And also in the body of Christ, it's something that begins small and it, and it begins to grow and grow. And it's active and it's working all over the earth. Lord, help us be mindful of that. Help us uh, follow those simple uh, yet profound instructions of repenting and humbling ourselves and relying on you and be agents of healing uh, to those folks. Help us participate in your kingdom individually and collectively. It's in Jesus Christ's name that we can and do pray. Amen. Well, I'm going to go ahead.